so without any further ado, I'll, I'll uh, invite uh, Michael Hoffman to, to do something uh, a little unusual. We're going to give the highlights of the meeting before it starts, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's like an appetiser uh, to get you in the mood. He's going to talk about some of the things you'll be hearing about and some of the posters. So welcome, Michael. Uh, thank you, Rod, uh, for, the, for the introduction and opening the fourth Theranostics World Congress. So this talk was supposed to be given by Richard Baum, uh, who sends his apologies uh, because he's uh, unwell. Uh, so I'm a nuclear medicine physician at uh, the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre in Melbourne, for those uh, who haven't met me before. And I had the pleasure of uh, going to the uh, third World Theranostics World Congress in Baltimore, uh, which I think was around... 18 months ago now, and uh, this is the abstract submissions for this Theranostics World Congress, and we've got 124 abstracts, either posters or oral presentations, from over, or from 26 countries, and you can see the breakup of the uh, presentations here. So this is quite a remarkable effort for a relatively uh, small meeting. I think there's almost about a third as many presentations as there are registrants, uh, and that's akin to the... Uh, amount of novel research which is happening in this uh, domain and the rapidly progressing knowledge uh, in this field. So the first World Theranostics World Congress was called a little bit different. It was the World Congress on Gallium-68 and Peptide Receptor Radionuclide Therapy. And you can see that the uh, current World Congress, the name has changed slightly and that's to uh, move a little bit beyond Gallium since there's a number of other uh, Theranostic pairs that are uh, uh, coming out and entering uh, clinical trials and clinical practice, and also because we're moving beyond PRRT, uh, particularly with theranostics in uh, prostate cancer. And I think if we compared it to this first meeting only uh, five years ago or so in 2011, this meeting was almost entirely dedicated to gallium 68 generators and treatment of neuroendocrine tumours. And uh, the meeting today, or this week, is going to have today on neuroendocrine tumours, tomorrow dedicated to prostate tumours, and then on Wednesday uh, talking about uh, novel theranostics in other areas. Uh, we're pleased uh, still to have uh, several of the founders of this meeting uh, here over the week. We've got Frank Roche, who ran the first meeting with Richard Baum, uh, who will be chairing a session uh, later this morning. We've got uh, Professor Singh from Chandigarh, and uh, Richard Wall from the last meeting uh, is here uh, with us as well. So I'm just going to run through some of the highlights. Uh, we asked uh, uh, oral and poster uh, submitters to uh, submit some highlight slides, and those that did, I've selected a few uh, ones that stood out as uh, being research of interest. And I'll start with the neuroendocrine tumours and then move to the prostate and finally uh, the novel theranostics paralleling day one, two and three of this meeting. So we're privileged to have uh, Professor Jonathan Strasberg who will be uh, summarising the uh, NETA-1 phase three randomised controlled trial on PRRT for uh, metastatic neuroendocrine tumours. And he'll present the latest updates uh, of this uh, trial. And I won't, I won't uh, go through it in any detail, but when we look at this chart of overall survival, there's, to me, a very marked separation. We read a lot of trials and in the general oncology world, it's often hard to separate those two lines between the arms. And here we're seeing a, a really marked difference, and they haven't even had to alter the scale between 0 and 100 to show that. In many oncology trials, you'll see them narrow out that y-axis just so that they can uh, show you the difference between the two arms. And here they're, they're showing us the truth, which is that there's a large difference, not in a surrogate outcome, uh, but in overall survival. And uh, interesting to highlight the fact that there were more withdrawals due to adverse events in the comparator arm, in the hormone treatment arm with octreotide, than there were in the lutate arm. Uh, so this is a very well-tolerated treatment. I think there are, uh, there are some treatments in oncology that prolong your life, but may not improve your quality of life. So you may live a few extra months, uh, but you might be uh, living that time fairly miserably because of side effects of the treatment, and I'm pleased to see that uh, Professor Strasberg will be uh, presenting some quality of life data from the study, which I haven't seen uh, presented before. I think was recently presented at ESMO, and, and it looks very positive. In, in the global health scales, improved 28% in the 
PRRT arm compared to 15% in the hormone arm. Uh, diarrhea improved almost 40% in the PRRT arm compared to 23% uh, in the hormone arm. So not only does it uh, prolong your life by what it looks like many, many months, uh, but it improves your uh, quality of life. Uh, we have Professor uh, Harvey Turner from uh, Fremantle in Perth who will be uh, presenting on uh, day of the three of the Congress and he's got some updated data on uh, some of the prospective work that he's been doing combining PRRT uh, with radiosensitising chemotherapy and he's uh, produced this table of myelodysplasia syndromes and we can see that the rates vary in different countries. Uh, France being up there at uh, 20% uh, and this is a country where PRRT has not really been available so I think these were patients that were perhaps treated outside of the country and returning but perhaps he can uh, clarify that for us. But there is a note here that from his Australian data 0% uh, myelodysplasia but when temozolomide was added it seems to rise to 5.4%. Uh, so we'll be interested in hearing uh, some more details about that. So we do need to know about how our PRRT works in a little bit more detail. And here's some interesting data using gamma H2AX to look at, uh, to measure double-stranded DNA breaks uh, from the group of, of uh, Professor Lasman uh, from, from Germany. And they've looked at this uh, comparing a group of patients that had personalised activities of PRRT versus a, a sort of one-size-fit-all. And this is probably a little bit hard to see, but my reading of this is this patient was given 19.3 gigabecrals of lutate in a personalised dose, which is certainly much higher than would have been given in the uh, NETA-1 trial. Uh, so we'll be interested in seeing how that correlates with some uh, markers of, uh, or at least some surrogate markers, of DNA damage and response. Now, this is some fascinating work from uh, Irina Velikin from Uppsala, looking at uh, the best way to perform gallium dototoc and gallium dotate imaging. If we adjust the specific radioactivity, uh, which is really the amount of uh, hot peptide to the amount of uh, cold peptide that's in the specimen, the image quality can change significantly. So here are three different uh, images uh, just by adjusting the specific radioactivity. And you can see that the one in the middle is the best. Uh, we can see the tumour in the liver with almost no liver background, whereas the uh, very low amount of uh, peptide, we can see higher liver background and higher spleen, whereas if you give too much, uh, the target to background diminishes. So the best specific radioactivity is the optimised one, not, not the highest uh, and not the lowest. And uh, this is an interesting chart. So we can really continue to optimise our imaging and therapy to a greater degree uh, just by uh, adjusting what we already do uh, a little bit better. Uh, we have some interesting data from, uh, from our own group in Australia looking at uh, copper 64 uh, sartate, which is a uh, octreotate labelled to a long half-life positron emitter through a novel uh, chelator called sarcophagene. And the advantage of this is that we can do delayed imaging out to 24 hours, and you can see a patient imaged at 30, 64 and 24 hours compared to the dototate at 60 minutes and as you come out to 24 hours your liver background washes out so we get a uh, much greater tumour to background uh, which may be useful for imaging uh, but more so for doing prospective dosimetry. Uh, we saw that earlier slide of a group giving almost 20 gigabecrals of lutetium and perhaps once we can do uh, patient specific dosimetry uh, we can really optimise the treatments that we are already doing. And moving beyond conventional neuroendocrine tumours, there are some uh, rarer tumours, pheochromocytomas, paragangliomas, uh, which fall into this family of neuroendocrine tumours. This is some uh, interesting work from Richard Baum's group in Bad Berka looking at uh, uh, somatostatin receptor scintigraphy in glomus uh, tumours. And some more interesting work looking at CXCR4, uh, a different target uh, for imaging paragangliomas. Uh, another area of interest with PRRT is for paediatric neuroblastomas. This is the most uh, common cause of death in children from a solid organ uh, malignancy. And we certainly also have an interest in using PRRT uh, to treat uh, children. And here's some interesting data from uh, Chandigarh uh, showing uh, some rather uh, spectacular images using gallium dotate for response evaluation. You can see the baseline and following uh, several or eight cycles of chemotherapy. And if you were to image this child with a, a bone scan or a CT or an MR, 
you certainly don't get this uh, accurate uh, evaluation of treatment response. Uh, so we really need to move neuroblastoma into uh, newer generation images, imaging to uh, try to optimise the sequence of therapies and abandoned therapies when they're not working uh, in these children. Uh, there's some interesting work on gallium extendin 4, which targets the GLP-1 uh, receptor, uh, useful for primarily benign insulinomas, but also here a case of uh, metastatic insulinoma, uh, which was only seen uh, with this imaging modality in someone who had had multiple other tests, uh, including MRI, ultrasonography, and various uh, molecular imaging uh, techniques. So day two of the meeting will be on prostate-specific membrane antigen, PSMA, and this has really uh, come out of nowhere. I suspect in the first World Congress, PSMA probably was not even mentioned back in 2011. It wasn't even on the radar. And now we have a whole day uh, devoted to prostate cancer. And I think actually probably the most number of oral and scientific abstracts uh, is in the prostate cancer space, a marker of this rapidly evolving area. Here's some interesting work from Richard Baum's group uh, in Bad Burka, which will be uh, presented by Avaral Singh, uh, comparing gallium PSMA PET to fluoride PET, which is a bone imaging agent. And on the patient on the left, there's a match. Uh, probably the PSMA wins. We can see sites lighting up with high target to background. But this patient here has very low PSMA uptake, but really strikingly high uptake on the PET uh, bone scan. So this patient would not be suitable uh, for PSMA therapy but may be suitable for uh, bone-seeking radionuclide therapy that we've been doing in nuclear medicine uh, for a long time. And it's pleasing to see that there is uh, some progress being made in this area too. So before we move on to PSMA therapy, uh, we need to spend a few moments looking at bone-seeking radionuclide therapy. And this is some data that will be presented on lutetium-177 EDTMP. Uh, so this is perhaps a newer version of samarium 153 EDTMP or strontium therapy and you can see high tumour to background within bones and uh, some even more novel work using gallium uh, dota zelendronate. Uh, uh, this is PET scanning but this group uh, from Bonn has also uh, labelled this with lutetium 177 uh, for therapy. So the future of this space may be to uh, combine PSMA therapy uh, with some bone seeking radionuclide therapy. Here we can see some uh, lutetium zelendronate post-therapy uh, images and dosimetry. And it's uh, worthy of note that the red marrow doses are relatively low uh, and they've compared it to PSMA 617 and even uh, dotatate. Now coming back to PSMA imaging, although HBED, uh, the PSMA 11 from the Heidelberg group is the dominant uh, one in use around the world, there are a variety of uh, other PSMA targeting agents using a variety of radio traces uh, that are emerging. This is one that has come out of King's College Group using gallium THP PSMA, another uh, novel collator. Uh, this collator labels at uh, room temperature uh, very, very rapidly within uh, seconds and can be uh, made into a kit form, much like we use with uh, technetium 99M. And we'll see some preclinical data, and I'll also present tomorrow. Uh, the first in human data using uh, gallium THP uh, PA, PSMA PET uh, in man. Uh, we're privileged to have Professor Andre Iagaru from uh, Stanford uh, presenting at this meeting and only last week he won the mini award for the best radiology image of 2016 with this uh, intra-patient uh, comparison of uh, six different traces for imaging prostate cancer. Uh, FDG, sodium fluoride, carbon 11 acetate, uh, choline, PSMA, and a newer tracer that he's uh, been involved in developing, RM2. And you can see that in this particular patient, these retroperitoneal nodes light up uh, brightest uh, with the RM2 agent. So we'll be very interested to hear uh, more about this. Now uh, we can label PSMA with indium-111 and also technetium-99M. And the group from Munich that I had the pleasure of spending a little bit of time with earlier in the year whilst I was on sabbatical, uh, are using intraoperative probes as a standard of care uh, with their surgical colleagues uh, in order to uh, find the lymph nodes. And uh, they've now got some outcome data uh, when they use that approach 
and you can see that this PSA uh, waterfall plot looks pretty impressive. So it may be that if you can aid the surgeon uh, in finding the nodes, uh, that we can improve outcomes rather than having uh, failed surgery. I think we're going to see a lot of impressive pictures of uh, lutetium-177 PSMA-directed uh, therapy for prostate cancer. Uh, this has uh, come out of the Heidelberg group in Germany, and we can see the response in this therapy, uh, really almost a complete response uh, after two cycles of therapy. And uh, that uh, treatment is now used in, uh, probably in several dozen centres around the world, uh, predominantly in Europe, but also in uh, India and now in Australia. And we're going to see some impressive data from a variety of centres. Uh, this is quite a spectacular response. Uh, here's an example from Bad Berker of a patient with a PSA of 350 with very widespread disease. And uh, 10 months later, after completing therapy, a PSA of 0, 0.0, uh, a very, very impressive response. And we'll have our own data from Melbourne uh, showing some uh, similarly uh, spectacular responses with this therapy. Uh, but there are, nevertheless, there are some patients that aren't responding to beta therapy with lutetium-177. And uh, I'm pleased to see that we have some groups presenting uh, data with alpha therapy. Uh, this is from uh, our South African colleagues presenting data on bismuth 213 uh, after three cycles of therapy. And again, we can see a, at least the complete response on uh, gallium PSMA uh, imaging. Moving on to other theranostics, we can uh, label a variety of other substances. Here we'll see some uh, uh, novel nanotheranostic platform in which a variety of uh, labels have been tagged uh, onto this uh, substance, onto this nanovesicle, which can be then used with MRI imaging, PET, photodynamic, photothermal, and uh, photoacoustic imaging. Uh, so really some very uh, novel uh, imaging and potential for drug delivery and uh, treatments. Uh, another little theme of this conference is that there's quite a few uh, posters and a uh, few oral abstracts on uh, copper 64, a long half-life uh, positron emitter. And this is not something that I was too aware of, but uh, copper 64 metabolism, uh, unlabeled to anything, is very important in a variety of cellular uh, processes, including uh, perhaps uh, how tumours metastasise cellular proliferation. And here's some data from ANSTO uh, looking at how uh, uh, copper imaging uh, can uh, be used to assess uh, whether this novel target uh, decreases intracellular copper levels and whether this uh, results in uh, changes in efficacy of this drug. So we can perhaps use this for a variety of trace metals even beyond copper uh, to better understand our normal uh, physiologic processes and also metabolic and other pathways that occur in cancer uh, to continue to uh, try to understand how these therapies work and how to optimise them. We can use gallium PSMA for a number of tumours uh, beyond prostate cancer. This is a target that is expressed in other tumours and here's some interesting data in uh, breast cancer from, our, from South Africa uh, showing moderate uptake in this metastatic uh, breast cancer, and I was interested to see that this group have gone on to treat some patients with breast cancer with alpha uh, labelled PSMA, and they have some data on that uh, at this meeting. Uh, beyond uh, our beta targeted therapy and our alpha targeted therapies, we do have OJ uh, therapy. We still actually treat in our centre with indium 111. Uh, dotatate therapy in selected patients with very widespread bony metastases where we're concerned about uh, crossfire to marrow. And that works through its uh, OJ effect. And here's some uh, novel data comparing indium-111 to an old nuclear medicine tracer, gallium-67, uh, comparing uh, cell survival as well they increase the dose in this model. And we can see that gallium-67 uh, performs uh, similarly to indium-111. So we may uh, get a resurgence in use in gallium-67 now that there are very good collators uh, for gallium. And clearly what we do with gallium-68 can all be directly transferred uh, back to gallium-67. Uh, and as I look through all the highlight slides that were presented to me, uh, just from an imaging perspective, a bit like that uh, 
uh, aren't many awards that, uh, that Stanford has recently received. This was probably the best image that I saw uh, for this meeting, although there may be others that I don't have highlight slides for. But this is a HER2 uh, a mini body uh, labelled to gallium 68. And we can see quite extraordinary uh, target to background at an early time point, so very rapid uptake uh, into the liver and bone metastases uh, in this patient. And they were able to look at both HER2 and HER negative patients, uh, comparing it to FDG uh, to look at tumour heterogeneity and perhaps better stratify which patients will benefit from HER2 imaging uh, and also perhaps use it to choose the best dose of Herceptin for a patient. I, think, I believe at the moment patients are just dosed on a per kilogram uh, uh, dose, which doesn't make a lot of sense because we know from our imaging, both with PRRT, that the amount of antibody or peptide should be adjusted to tumour burden and only with imaging uh, can we potentially achieve this individualised dosing of drugs. So even beyond uh, radiolabeled uh, theranostics, a lot of what we can do can be shifted back to the conventional drug world. So that's hopefully a little bit of a taste of some of the uh, novel science that you'll see over the next three days. So I think we're all in for a, for a bit of a treat. And uh, now I will hand back over the podium to uh, Professor Nicholas Aid and uh, Jean-Mathieu Beauregard that'll uh, introduce our next uh, speaker. Thank you very much.